Today's uh, presentation is being done by SDR Engineering. SDR Engineering is a multidisciplinary firm founded in 1992. Uh, they actually complete, uh, they do a wide range of services, including commercial, residential, construction services, structural design, rehabilitation, and site development. They have offices located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Dallas, Texas, and Tallahassee, Florida. Right now, their main specialty focuses on design analysis, uh, rehabilitation, strengthening, land development, and planning. They also have some, uh, some divisions for failure investigation, um, inspections, as well as uh, in instrumentation monitoring. Some of their main expertise, as I mentioned, will include bridge design, uh, structural design, structural evaluation, um, testing, as well as uh, they do a lot of research and code developments. Uh, one of the most recent one is done by Louisiana DOT for their bridge design and evaluation manual. The two presenters we have today are Dr. Hatem Selim and Dr. Mahmoud Reda Hanna. Um, today, Mahmoud Reda uh, Nana will be the one to present for the, the presentation. So we'll, we'll begin by passing over the control over to him and his uh, screen so he'll be able to share everything and begin the presentation. We'll begin shortly in a second. Okay, Dr. Mahmoud, can, can you hear me? Yes, uh, okay. I can hear you. Perfect. Well, you have control over the, the mic and the presentation. So once we are able to get you live, we will get started. So if, if you could just activate your screen, we can get started right away. Okay. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so you guys can can hear me now? Yes, this is Dr. Hatem. Yes, speaking. Okay, Dr. Hatem, in that case, we have made you the presenter, so you can actually get started on uh, focusing on your presentation. Okay. While you're doing that, again, to the audience, we do apologize about the, the, the technical difficulties. Um, so as soon as everything is up and ready, we'll get started. Yeah, um, uh, can you guys see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. I'm sorry, apparently I was joining as a presenter, but there has been an email sent differently that with requiring different registration. So anyways, I'm, uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm here. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, being patient with us today. And uh, I hope everybody is doing well and staying safe. Today we are going to present uh, one of our recent projects for uh, analyzing and load rating a continuous post-tensioned uh, precast girder I-shaped girder bridges and uh, as Bede introduced Dr. Uh, Manna uh, Mahmoud uh, is the other presenter and both of us have been worked on this project together and I was fortunate to be working with Mahmoud on this and uh, he will definitely share with you a lot of his uh, experience from this project and so just uh, quickly to go through the the bridge and the outline for this we'll just uh, talk about the bridge in general uh, and then the finite element modeling that we had to do to do the analyzing the bridge to to determine the internal forces so we can do the load rating of the bridge the first part of the bridge description so as you can see this is a two span bridge continuous uh, the total bridge length is approximately 280 feet. Each span is 140 feet, and uh, we will describe later the two spans were made continuous together. So it's one uh, continuous uh, span, 280 feet. And the bridge is crossing an interstate system. So the bridge, the superstructure of the bridge is made of uh, uh, five precast girders spaced at approximately nine feet and the total bridge width is approximately 43 feet and the deck slab is a seven inch deck slab acting in composite action with the precast girders 
Now, as I explained, the girders are uh, uh, to type 5 I-beams, which is which is 63 inches deep, uh, the girder itself. And uh, the girder is pre-tensioned uh, with uh, 14 bottom strands and four top strands. And the strands are a half inch strands, grade 270. So those are the pretension girders, and that's mainly the pretension is provided uh, during the construction of the girders and uh, for during transportation and during erection, as we will see. But they are just mainly to carry the own weight of the girders or the beams. And then the beams are provided with post tensioning, which is continuous and which is making the bridge entirely continuous together. And then the deck is made continuous by using uh, closure pores or cast in place joints or weight joints. Uh, just a brief, the beams are I-shaped, but due to the continuity, you would expect, as you can see here in the middle part of the uh, bridge, closer to the intermediate support, the beam is made as a solid section or a rectangular section, as you will see the reason for that, which is expected because that's a high negative moment area and it's a high shear zone area. Uh, and Mo will explain the details when you calculate the capacity of this section with the negative moment. Why do you need to make it rectangular? Because of the high tension force and you need a high compression area for the concrete to resist the forces. So mainly the solid section or the solid part of the beam and that is mainly made through that the beam itself is made rectangular and also having a closure pore at the intermediate support. Just to give you an idea that how the the construction of the bridge and the sequence of the pre-tensioning and the post-tensioning is also impacting the analysis and how the bridge is designed. So the bridge, the span, the 140 feet span is made approximately of two segments. Each segment is approximately 70 feet. So the the girder transported to the site is not the entire 140 feet span. It is basically 69 or 70 feet span. And then to do that, you will have to use an intermediate support or a temporary shoring uh, between the two segments. This is the center line of the intermediate bend, and this is definitely the abutment. So from this center line of bend to the abutment, that's your 140 feet, for the 140 feet. So you have 69 feet segment transported to the sides. They are already pre-tensioned with the 14 bottom strands and four top strands or six top strands. And then you have the PT, the post-tensioning ducts inserted inside the girders. Now, to make this span continuous, you have to have this one and a half foot closure pour between the two segments is cast with the deck. And there is the other closure pour at the intermediate support. So basically the two spans are made of four segments and the four segments are all made continuous by casting the deck with the closure pour. After you cast the deck and the closure pour and you reach a concrete strength of 5,000 PSI, the post tensioning, the continuous post tensioning is applied. And definitely this is an approximate shape drawn in PowerPoint to show that the cables are drip cables and definitely they are um, elevated once you get closer to the intermediate support so the continuous post tensioning cables can produce moments uh, opposite to the moment from the external forces or the applied forces on the bridge. So given this construction of the bridge that is how will impact your analysis and it will also will impact your internal forces to determine the primary uh, post-tensioning forces and the secondary post-tensioning forces in addition to the moments uh, from the external applied loads either as dead loads or live loads. Now let's start the finite element modeling and how we uh, utilize the staged construction feature. Uh, and that's the only way you have to do with the, with the staged construction due to the existence of the pre-tensioning strands in the precast segments. And then how the segments were made continuous together by a user of the closure pores, or some people call them wet joints or cast in place joints, and then the continuous post-tensioning. So the first stage, which is having the four segments. Each segment is a simply supported segment. And for the segments uh, to be in place, you have to have the temporary shoring or the temporary support at the closure pores. So you have one abutment at both ends, and then you have the intermediate bent, and then at mid-span 
of each of the 140 foot uh, span length, you need a temporary shoring or a support to be able to uh, erect the precast segments. Definitely the pretension or the pre-stressing, generally just also to make sure that terminology is clear. The word pre-stressing, it's supposed to mean either pre-tension or post-tension. It is generic, that is how it is, but in many states or in many practice, people refer to the pre-tension as pre-stressing only. So to uh, avoid any confusion during this seminar, we adopted the word pre-tension and post-tension since both of them shall fall under the umbrella of a pre-stressing force. So the pre-tension force is applied at uh, is applied at the stage Z, stage one, which is the simply supported segments. You can see in the model how the bottom strands were applied and the top strands were applied. So you will have moments in the beam from the own weight of the girders or the segments and the uh, moments due to the pre-tension force applied. Now the deck, the weight of the fresh concrete applied on the deck and the weight of the closure pores are acting on the simply supported beam segments since the, they are acting in simple manner. And you can see the weight of the fresh concrete is applied to the simply supported segments. Once the deck is cast and hardened, you will have the deck acting in composite action with the uh, beams. However, they are, not they are not continuous yet. So in other words, the moments due to the own weight or the fresh concrete of the deck is acting, still acting on the simply supported. So the temporary shoring is still active at this stage. Then you move to the stage four. Once you apply the post-tensioning force, now the temporary shoring or the intermediate support at the segments does not exist anymore. And that is simply you would expect because of the strands the PT tendons, they are acting at the bottom part of the beam here. So the beam at the intermediate shoring will lift up, which is due to camber. And in this case, you will expect that the beam is acting two span continuous and the temporary shoring is definitely no longer needed. So you have to eliminate or remove the supports representing the temporary shoring at this stage while you are applying the post tension. Uh, also to let you know, I mean, uh, the post tensioning force was applied from both ends so we had two live ends and that's mainly uh, to minimize the friction losses since you have two live ends and instead of applying the, the pre-stressing force from one end which will have more losses due to uh, friction and also the anchorage slip so now you have two live ends and this was taken into consideration when we estimated the losses so this is a stage four with the PET tendons now, just to let you know that to estimate the losses in the PT, since we have pre-tension and post-tension, so we had to use the refined estimates for the time-dependent losses according to the H2. And just to give you an idea of the number, we estimated the PT losses to be uh, approximately 22. It was exactly 22.3. But again, it was dependent on the location of the tendon. We have three tendons, but on average, it was 22%, just to give you an idea. And that's mainly because of the long span as well. So the friction was significant losses as expected for uh, post-tension in general. Definitely, we are showing here a sample of the calculation. This was a, a tedious calculation that we carried out by hand due to the complexity and the importance of the bridge, we had to do everything by my desk and do everything also by in-house hand uh, calculation. So we have to double check each other. Now, just to give you an idea, that is the actual cable profile or that is the physical cable profile based on the eccentricities provided. So that's the shape of the cable as you expect that you will have higher eccentricity at mid span and you have a smaller eccentricities at the intermediate support and you will see the reason for doing that when we compare the actual or the physical cable profile and the effective cable profile you see that this eccentricity increases significantly at the intermediate support and that's the whole idea of having continuous post tensioning. 
Now the stage after that was applying the barrier load on the top of the deck, and that's mainly applied to the continuous structure, and it's applied to the exterior beam since we are doing a refined analysis. So we'd like to maintain it as accurate as possible, and we applied as uniform load uh, on top of the exterior beams. And then the post-construction phase, which means that you have the construction completed and the structure is ready for vehicular live load to apply the different live load. Uh, in this presentation, we will mainly focus on the HL93, which is the common truck or the design truck according to Astro, so the numbers are familiar to everybody without going into the different type of construction. And just to let you, just to show you a sample that uh, the maximum positive moment, which was approximately at mid-span, we know that the maximum positive moment is slightly off the mid-span due to the continuity. But as expected, that the case of loading that produce maximum positive moment in an exterior beam, you are loading one span with two lanes with multi-lane. And approximately the HL93 truck is acting at mid-span. Now, when you try to find the location for the live load, you have to remember, according to the ASH2, that to find the maximum negative or uh, finding maximum reaction, you have to consider also loading two spans at the same time with 50 feet minimum distance between the two trucks and also reduce the load by 90%. And this is also a feature that we utilized in uh, my desk to be able to find the maximum negative moment for the exterior beam. And that is the loading position that produces the maximum negative moment in our exterior beam uh, for the, at the maximum negative and the intermediate support of the exterior beam. Uh, now, by this, now I'll move to the structure analysis, and then after that, the load rating. And I think uh, Dr. Manna, he will be able to, he is the one who's going to present this section and discuss the details with you. I'm sorry if I had to go a little bit fast, and that's mainly I want to, 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 to stay on track with respect to time to make sure that we are within the one hour. So I now I will hand it over to Bid or uh, Dr. Manna so he can uh, present the remaining sections of the presentation. Okay, Dr. Manna, you should, you should have access to present now. Okay, Can you see that? Uh, we see your second screen. Um, okay, let me see. Okay, can you see my screen now? Uh, you, now we can, perfect. Okay, uh, thank you Dr. Hakim, and thank you everyone for being with us today. I'm so sorry for this technicality on the connection, and uh, I will try to keep it in the one hour window and not go uh, much more. Uh, as Dr. Hatim said, I will be talking about the two other stages, uh, two, our, uh, two other points of our presentation today, the structure analysis part. Basically, we are done with the finite element and we are looking into the straining actions. After that, I will conduct the load rating um, uh, based on um, LRFR. Also, uh, the load rating we conducted was um, uh, conducted by our in-house uh, calculation or in-house spreadsheet plus the MyDAS load rating uh, module. Uh, now I'm saying I'm I'm showing you the first stage, 
which is the bending moment. All the segments are uh, simply supported and they carry its own weight. So basically WL squared over A will give you the moment for each of the segments. The next stage is actually we're still in the first stage. We have in that stage both the own weight of the segments plus that uh, the pre-stressing force or the pre-stressing effect coming from the pretensioned strand. We have 18 pretensioned strands, 14 at the, uh, the bottom, and the four strands at the top. Uh, as you can see here, the moment we are presenting the moment that exists on the, each segment by itself. We move forward for the stage number two. On the stage number two, in addition to the moment that's coming from the own way, we have the fresh concrete or the weight of the uh, concrete or cast in place concrete on the uh, on each segment. That will increase your moment or the total dead load uh, acting on each, on each segment. Uh, if you recall, the stage number three made the model continuous composite girder, considering the concrete is already hardened. But in reality, the girder will not be continuous till we have the post tensioned cable. Uh, installed and which be, will be able to resist the developed moment on the continuous beams. So stage two, stage three doesn't have any loading. However, stage four, we already applied the post tensioning, uh, the post tensioning force. If you are working with a post tensioned element, you have to tell yourself, is this a statically determined or a statically indeterminate element? If it is a statically, in, uh, statically determined element, the pre-stressing effect results uh, from the eccentricity of the cable only, which is known as primary moment, which we are showing here. Basically, you multiply your pre, uh, you multiply your uh, tension force or the stressing uh, or the post-tension force with the eccentricity uh, of the cable. However, if the element is statically indeterminate, like the continuous uh, beam that we have now there will be additional moment called secondary moment comes from the indeterminacy of the system. Here, we are showing the, the bending moment due to primary post-tension force on the top and the secondary uh, moment uh, coming from the indeterminacy effect. Both moments, if you sum them together, will give you the total moment due to the post-tensioning. Uh, if you want to find the effective a cable profile, you just have to divide the total moment from the post tensioning over the uh, post tensioning force, and you will get you uh, the effective cable profile that we are showing here. Once we are finished with the uh, construction stages, you can now remove the, the as Dr. Hatton said, we removed the, uh, the, uh, um, the temporary support at the closure uh, 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 joints, and the dead load would be acting on the continuous on the continuous uh, on the continuous uh, girders. <coughs> I'm sorry. And we can see here the total uh, moment, the total moment, and the total shear uh, for for the exterior for the exterior beam. Uh, you can see here that the major we are expecting that the, the maximum positive uh, moment will be not at the mid uh, at the middle. It will be shifted towards the uh, the end support. Also, the negative bending moment will be at uh, uh, the the maximum negative bending moment will locate at the center support uh, with a moment larger than the uh, the negative one, the positive one. As Dr. Hatim said, we will only run the HL93, which we are using for design. Uh, for, the, for the design, HL93 comes as a, as a truck, 72 uh, kip truck with a uniform load, which is 0.62 uh, uh, kip per feet. Uh, my desk can give you the, max, the envelope case, which will uh, give you the maximum uh, positive, um, the maximum uh, moment at each location uh, based on 
the based on locating the exact track or the load to give you the maximum effect. Uh, as we are trying to do the load rating, we can conduct load rating at each section. But for us, we already know that the load rating we, we, it will be governed by the minimum uh, rating factor, which will locate at the critical section. So for a moment, we are we defined three sections. Uh, F1, which is the maximum positive, um, uh, F1, which is the maximum positive, um, uh, the, is the maximum positive bending moment location, uh, while F2 is a section for the negative bending moment. This is F2. F3, we, uh, we know that F3 is, has moments that is closer, kind of closer to F2. However, the section itself has a different uh, uh, configuration or different uh, shape, which results in a different moment capacity. F2 has a much larger uh, compression area at the bottom, while F3 has less because of the tapered section of the eye shape. Uh, if you look at the table that we are showing here, you find F1, F2, F3, you find the uh, moment comes for the exterior and interior beams. You'll find that F2 is the, uh, minus 2,360, uh, while F3, which is uh, give you uh, minus 1,533 for the live load effect. For the shear, uh, the the maximum reaction or the maximum uh, the maximum uh, shear force will be located at the middle uh, support. Uh, for uh, if the distribution of the stair up is the same at uh, throughout the 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 girder, the governing section will be at the point where you have a less uh, web of uh, of your beam. So basically, we choose two sections, S1 and S2. S1 is located at the beginning of the tables uh, of the eye shape, and uh, uh, S2 has similar shape as S1. However, S1 and S2 has different distribution of stairs. S1 has six uh, inch spacing, while S2 has 12 inch spacing. Uh, now we go to the last part of our presentation, which is the uh, load rating. Uh, on that part, I will conduct the load rating, as I said, based on the SDR uh, um, um, mass cat sheet that we developed here, or and also I will do the load rating based on my from my test module. Uh, the purpose of conducting the load rating is to find the the live load carrying capacity for the bridge, which will determine the ability of the bridge to carry the design live load. Uh, or if the bridge needs to be posted for the, for, for the legal load, or for the legal vehicles, we can know based on the rating factor or the based on the rating of the bridge. The procedure is very simple. You just have to calculate the capacity of the section and uh, calculate the demand from the dead uh, load, subtract it from the capacity and divide it over the live load to give you the rating uh, factor for that section or based on uh, your limit state. We conducted, as I said before, that we conducted the load rating uh, based on the LRFR procedure. I was according to the manual for bridge evaluation. And uh, we have, um, it checked two limit states, service limit states, which includes the stresses at the extreme fiber uh, of the section. Also, the strength was for the flexure and shear, uh, uh, the shear force. This table is showing the load factor for the dead loads, uh, um, the live load, and also for the pre-stressing effect is very important. If we are dealing with the post tensioning, uh, we have, and especially in statically indeterminate post tension, we have to know the pre stressing effect, how to come to play into uh, the section. If it's gonna be 
uh, you will include both primary or and secondary, or you will include only the secondary, such as in a case where you are checking the strengths and the state. Uh, service three, you have dead load was one load factor and strengths one, 1.25. For the inventory or the design HL93, you will have 0.8 and 1.75. Uh, the pre-stressing is always one. Now I will talk a little bit about the section design or the section analysis uh, in terms of the capacity. We are trying to find the capacity of the section um, for F1, F2, and F3. The cable itself or the cable profile is different uh, or location is different from each section. F1 is very fortunate uh, section. The, ca the cables are located at the top, at the bottom, and the lever arm is huge in terms of uh, you have uh, cables at the bottom and you have a very wide flange on the top. Uh, the uh, that will give you a, a very high capacity compared to the other two sections. If you go to F2, you will find that the cables located still on the precast uh, element which will decrease your lever arm from the center of the cable to the compression part, which in this case will be at the bottom of the section. That will lead to a less capacity for the section, and also you will have a smaller strain at the cable location or the center of your cable. If you go to F3, it's much worse because now you have you still have a smaller lever arm compared to uh, F1. Also, the compression part is the bottom, but the compression area is not as wide as F2 or even at for F1. So you will have a, the, the neutral axis will shift more towards the, the cable. That will give you a smaller lever arm and also will give you smaller, uh, a smaller uh, strain at the location of your cables. As we said, we designed or de conducted the load rating from based on a spreadsheet that we developed in SDR. And uh, I'm showing here the, uh, the capacity of uh, the maximum positive section F1. You can see here all the calculation was done and the capacity was almost 12,500 feet. Um, let's look at the capacity for each section. We used the H2 equation to calculate the capacity for each section. And also we use the strain compatibility method to get the strains for each at each uh, um, to calculate the strain for the uh, for the post-tensioned cables. As I, as we expected, F1 has a very large capacity compared to the other F2 and F3. You find that uh, the strength reduction factor is one. Uh, that is based on the uh, strain is or the net strain on the cable is very large. You go to F2, you find that the nominal capacity is less. The strain was in the transition zone between a tension control section and compression control section with a strength reduction factor of 0.9. F3, as we expected, it has a less level arm and also has a less strain at the location of the post-tensioned cables, which or the net strain will govern as a compression control section with a fee factor of 0.75. So the, the FC will control the load rating of this bridge in terms of the moment. S1 and S2, the shear uh, capacity, uh, we are dealing with a post-tensioned beam, so the duct will affect the stress distribution inside your web. And H2 uh, takes this effect by subtracting half of the duct width from the effect from the from the width of the of the um, of the girder, uh, and uh, that was employed in our spreadsheet also to calculate the capacity for section S1 and S2. S1, we have a spacing of six inch and uh, S2, we have a spacing of 12 inch. We calculated the nominal shear capacity 
based on the general procedure to get the theta and beta uh, for for the for each of the for each section. I'm showing here only S1 with a 500 kip, almost 500 kip capacity. S, uh, this is comparing S1 and S2. As expected, S2 is less. The, the, the state of contribution is less in the nominal capacity, which leads to 369 compared to 500 kips for the S1. Uh, the load rating we calculated based on the equation that I provided before. And we calculated for all sections. I'm just presenting F1 and S1. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the strength is 2.3 and 2.98 for operating. And shear was 1.5, which is pretty good. Just a very quick uh, on my desk load rating and design. Uh, on those locations, we the idea was to compare our results that we have obtained from our in-house spreadsheet and the my desk results. All the numbers that you, you saw here have been verified based on hand calculation and my desk as of the Hatem set. So F1, F2, and F3 are located at those elements. In my desk, you just have to go ahead and choose the output or the design at those locations. Uh, on the tab, if you want to see the exact Calculations, the stresses at the location of your um, of your strands on uh, the stresses, the capacity, all the detailed calculation that you already did in by hand calculation or using the spreadsheet, you can go ahead and uh, on my desk and go to the pre-stressed uh, concrete design module and get extract those results uh, after you, of course you define the material the parameters and also the load case that you want or the limit states uh, based. Uh, I'm showing here the flexure for F1. You can see down here is 12,360, pretty much uh, closer to our uh, results. Also, I'm showing here the shear capacity on the right side. Um, the rating, you can go ahead and click if you have the module for the load rating. You can go ahead and uh, choose to load rate the section or the element, and it will give you the output at the location where you are expected. 2.28 is pretty good. We have 2.3. That's nice for the flexural load rating. Uh, for the shear, same thing. You can go ahead and conduct the rating uh, on my desk at that location, and it will give you the uh, almost the same. Uh, will give you the same, or should be give you the same results as you have by hand calculation. With this one, I thank you all for your patience, and I am really sorry for that uh, technicality in the beginning and a delay for start. Okay, thank you, thank you, Doctor uh, Mahmoud. Uh, we're going to take a couple minutes to answer a few questions. There were quite a few that came in. So if uh, Dr. we can Hunt make it Dr. take Mahmoud. five minutes, bid if you think. I mean, we can yes. make it just five minutes or ten minutes. I mean, it's up to the people if they want to stay or not. But we can take few questions, yeah, if you don't mind. That would be perfect. That would be perfect. perfect. So if everyone is willing to kind of stick around for a couple minutes and uh, sure. answer a couple of the questions, um, we'll do so. If you do need to leave, we understand. Again, this session is recorded, so if you do want to go back, we will send you the follow-up link later on. Okay, to start off with the first question, it's why six pretensioning strands were used on top of the girder? I mean, typically, I mean, with the pretension beams in general, you need to have all your pre stressing is at the bottom, that's expected. But also, you want to have top strands mainly for shrinkage. And during the uh, the stripping of the forms, if you don't have those top strands, there is a, always a tendency to see here cracks and cracks on the top. So they are not really for strength purpose. It's mainly for serviceability. So you don't want to leave the top strand at the top of the beam without any pre-stressing for cracking and uh, shrinkage. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tam. Yeah. Uh, the qu second question is, can you please teach how to pre-stress losses is considered in the model? 
Yeah, we did the calculation. I think Mo can elaborate in this, but in our model, I mean, we did all the uh, losses, uh, calculated them in the detailed method or the refined losses. We did that by our hand calculation, and we introduced the effective force in the model. The idea this bridge has been in service for almost 30 or 40 years. So to do the losses in general, to do the time dependent losses in my desk, you have to define time dependent material properties, which will account for the shrinkage and the creep of the concrete as well. What we did, we calculated all our losses in detail and we defined the effective force in the my desk model. Uh, Mahmoud, if you want to add something, but that's I know that's what we did because we did the calculation detailed outside and introduced the effective force because we are at service stage now. The bridge has been in service for 40 years already. Uh, yes, uh, as Dr. Hatim said, uh, we already did this one based on our calculations. However, if you want to do that, my desk has uh, the, the ability to do the the, the stress, uh, the be stress losses for all the strands and also for the post tension that you have. But for, as Dr. Hatton said, this one was in service for 40 years and we just go ahead and apply the final or the effective uh, post tension uh, and um, um, the post tension and uh, the be stressing uh, force as effective. We did not do it in my desk based on the detailed uh, output and define a time dependent material. We did not do that one in my desk. Yeah, go ahead, Bidia. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is uh, how did you remove, how did the removal of the temporary supports affect the dead load moment diagram? Yeah, this is a very tricky question. It's not a tricky, I mean, you have to think about it. Before you remove the temporary support, you have simply supported segments. And even when you have cast the deck, there is no change in the bond condition. What happens once you apply the post-tensioning force? The post-tensioning force, since the cable at mid-span is below the CG of the concrete, so it will push the beam up. That's why you have an upward moment. So the beam will camber upward, correct? So once you up, the beam start cambering upward, what happens is that the beam at mid-span will leave the intermediate support. So basically, your dead load moment will redistribute from a simply supported beam to a continuous beam. And this is when you see that now the dead load moment, even from the deck and the beam, will act on the new statical system. Once the beam is sitting on the temporary support, it will always act in a simply supported fashion segments. Once you put the pre-stressing force, that's the critical. You have to think deformation in this case. You don't think forces. Now the beam will camber upward, which means the beam will leave the temporary support. So now the own weight or the dead load, whatever load you have, which is the beam and the deck, will act on the new statical system. So that's why when Mo was showing the moments for the total dead loads, you have the dead load now on the continuous, the two-span continuous beam. So basically, when you check the service stage, which you are checking now, we have to check due to the dead loads on the continuous structure. Um, okay. I mean, there is a lot of details. I mean, even the pre-tensioning, if you see the maximum positive section, we should, I mean, we don't have time definitely to go into the details but this bridge has a lot of details like if you see the maximum positive section it was at 62 feet from the support which is almost at mid span this simply means that your pre-tension strands are almost negligible when you come to calculate the section capacity at mid span because it's very close to the closure pore so the pre-tension strands are even still in the development phase. So you did not develop much stresses. Even if you calculated as six feet, you start to see that, that the contribution of the pre-tension strands. In addition, the pre-tension strands are only 14 strands. The PT, the post-tension, they are 66 strands. So it, just to give you an idea of the difference in magnitude of force. So mainly the bridge is carried by the PT. And the other main point also, I don't want to go into detail. If you go to the effective cable profile, you will see that how much the secondary moment is helping you at the negative support. And it's not really helping you as much at the positive moment section. But 
I don't want to go much into detail, but that's precisely the, the, the effect of the continuity on the dead load moment. Wow, okay, thank you. I, I think there's a lot of questions uh, to the SDR staff, so I'm just gonna ask one more question. Sure. And what I'm gonna do is I'll share these questions with Dr. Tam and Dr. Uh, Reda Mahmoud, so sure. that way they could kind of address those uh, questions a little bit more in their perspective. And when we have the review email that goes out and when they go to the page, you'll be able to see the questions and see the answer, the corresponding answers. So that way everyone's, you know, kind of curiosity is sated. Okay, so we'll just go into one last question down the list. Um, the question comes in as, was there any issue with ASHTO service stress checks at the middle span while having top tendons continuous without debonding at the areas? Where they where they are not needed. No, again, as I said, I mean definitely the service, the mid span section. There is no problem at all in the mid span section. I mean that's even for service three. I mean the the uh, the negative moment is always the issue with the continuous structure. The negative moments are much higher. So I mean we didn't show all the rating factors, but correct me if I remember, Mahmoud. Even section F3 was the one that's controlling the rating, if I remember correctly. Section F1 at mid span was really the rating factor was 2.3 for service, and I think service three was was definitely lower, but it wasn't the issue. I think it was always section F3 or F2 actually. No, F3, the one at the negative, when you have an I section, I shaped section. So. The mid span was never an issue. Mahmoud, correct me if I'm wrong or if you want to add something. Yes, uh, you, you are correct. Yeah, so I mean, the, and the top strands, they're only four strands. They are not they are not really doing nothing. I mean, you have the bottom strands, you have the 14 and the 66. So the top strand is not really, and the service was not an issue. Okay, so again, Dr. Tam and Dr. Uh, Mahmoud, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for taking the time to address some of these questions and being able to present on your topic. Sure. Um, again, just letting you guys know, there is about another 16 questions that uh, well, are Well, I mean, I, I prefer <laughs> to answer them in, in speaking rather than in, uh, than in the writing so would it be better i mean if we just even if we end the seminar if you can tell me the question and i answer them verbally me and mahmoud while we are both here and <laughs> we recorded as part of the seminar i i would typically say yes but I, it, it's a lot so um we'll definitely conclude it off here today but thank okay. you so much um if there's anything else that we can do to uh, if there's any other questions that are coming in for the, the staff right now in the audience, sure. uh, please contact us right away and we'll be able to address them with Dr. Tem. If this becomes another thing where you they have a significant amount of questions, it always leaves the room to be able to open up another session with Dr. Tem and Dr. Retta to be able to kind of discuss these uh, questions and be able to formulate another opportunity to discuss it with the current audience. So okay. that's always an opportunity. Uh, and to the people who are listening in, that's something that if you guys are interested in doing, please send in your questions and we'll be able to kind of kind of uh, make the decisions from that point on. Okay? Sure. All righty. Thank you guys so much for the, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank before you. we end off, um, we have something called the Midas Expert Network that has been going on. And this is something that we have been focusing on in terms of developing a better community for the engineering uh, staff. And actually, Dr. Uh, Hatem is actually one of the members. Um, he's actually one of our expert influencers uh, for the Midas Expert Network. So it's actually a community that we have been promoting to that helps connect engineers in new innovative ways that provides opportunities for not, just not just marketing themselves, like kind of what SDR has been doing, but uh, themselves as an engineer, their companies, their opportunities, as well as potentially creating new business opportunities for the, the, the companies and the, the, the organization that they work for. Uh, so we do have a lot of government agencies as well as high profile companies who are linked with the network. 
so if there's any opportunities that you guys are looking for or looking to actually reach out or understand a little bit more about what the men can do, what the Midas Expert Network can do, please feel free to reach out. Uh, the website is very simple. It's midasoft.com slash midas-expert-network. When you go there, you'll be able to kind of see a little bit more details and see some of the case studies that uh, has been provided and some of the things that people have seen and how they were able to benefit from it. Because ultimately what we're looking to do is promote a better network so we can actually collaborate together as an engineering uh, community and be able to allow engineers to market themselves and their capabilities as well as the company's capabilities with each other. So it's another step up than the social networking that you guys have been doing. And uh, if for those who are interested in receiving this type of benefit, it's a very simple thing. You just need to sign up and fill in some questionnaires so that way you understand a little bit more about, we understand a little bit more about what you're looking for so we could connect you with the right people. However, if you're interested in being uh, a contributor, uh, an expert, kind of like Dr. Tem and Dr. Reda, uh, you can actually visit a correlating page to be an influencer. And we have a list of uh, influencers that are currently helping others as well to kind of reach out more on the technical level, guidance, uh, answer uh, various type of support questions, as well as more in detail in terms of uh, answering more uh, kind of like these type of webinars, QA, QC type. So uh, we strongly suggest you guys to kind of take a look. And if you guys have any more questions, feel free to reach out and discuss with it a little bit more. So it's a great opportunity. And best of all, it's currently free. So yeah, please reach out and we'll love to kind of see where we can take it and take you guys. All right. But overall, thank you guys for participating in the session. We do apologize again for the delay and the technical difficulties and issues we had in the beginning, but hopefully you guys are able to learn upon the session today. We do have a follow-up session coming up in a couple of weeks uh, with another engineer. His name is Dr. Anush Shamshabadi as well. So please uh, look out for that email and that invitation. And other than that, please enjoy the rest of the day and the week and please stay safe and healthy. Take care, guys.